It's like, I just kind of tapped into a whole new part of myself creatively that I didn't know that I had. And I was like, I need to do more with this. I, this, there's some, there's definitely something bigger than myself here that I kind of, I need to bring out of myself to like offer to people because obviously it's needed and it's so much more. I always tell people it's so much more than just a photo shoot. You're just like, wow, I could do that. And you just kind of have a little bit more sass to your walk leaving and like, you're just kind of up on cloud nine. It's, it's amazing. Hey everyone. Welcome to Venture Out, a podcast series from Entrepreneur North that shares the brave stories of Northerners who are inspiring innovation and community well-being through business. I'm your host, Zena Cowan. We are fires across the tundra. We are ice of a million years. Our mothers, our fathers hold us. We stand together. This is a really special episode for a few reasons. Today, you're going to meet the youngest entrepreneur we've featured yet on Venture Out, and she happens to be one of the hottest businesses I've come across here in Yellowknife, where our entrepreneur head office is based. Jamie Stevenson is a 22-year-old photographer from the Clean Show Nation, and she's built a remarkably successful business doing boudoir photo shoots. She photographs Northern clients in their lingerie and sometimes nothing at all. And the results are stunning, sexy photographs that really capture each individual's unique beauty, strength, and humanity. And Jamie's been doing boudoir for just over two years, and she's now got clients flying in from remote communities in the Northwest Territories for full day shoots with her and her team. Just a thought about Jamie's age. Thinking back to where I was at 22, I'm kind of floored by what Jamie is doing, both as an entrepreneur and as an artist. She's got a really strong vision for her photography, and she's also got that deep determination that is so important for any business owner, especially up here. She's also a good reminder that young people those who, you know, fall into the youth category need to be taken seriously because they're doing really important, impactful work. And they're also doing it in new, innovative ways that we can learn from. For example, Jamie talks about how big of a role social media and the internet has played in her professional development. Much of what she's learned about being a photographer, she's learned and taught herself from YouTube and Facebook. And social media is also where she connects with her clients and supporters on a daily basis. And I just think that's really cool. In this episode, you're also going to meet Jenny Vandermeer, who was Jamie's first boudoir client of 2021. And when Jenny talks about her experience, It's clear that she got so much more than just beautiful photographs. It was transformative for her. So without further ado, let's jump in and meet Jamie. Jamie, welcome to the podcast. Please introduce yourself and tell us about your business. My name is Jamie with Tridy Stevenson. I am from Beshiko and I've lived in Beshiko and grew up in Beshiko a good chunk of my life. I recently uh, started living in Yellowknife full time. I moved in Yellowknife um, August of 
2020. It's been great. And a little bit about my business. Well, I'm a photographer. I own a photography business and I shoot families. I shoot lifestyle. I shoot headshots. I shoot portraits. I shoot events. I shoot weddings. And one of the main things that I'm focusing on right now is Bedore. Okay. You're in big demand as a photographer. So we'll talk about your business in just a moment. But first, I want to hear about your home community of Beshiko, which for folks who don't know means big knife in the Klinchon language and is the largest Dene community in the Northwest Territories. What do you love most about it? I loved being able to have access to nature, like literally right, like 10 steps out of your door, like 10 steps out of your house, you're like in the bush and you're like, I love this. We had a quad at one point and like, I loved riding that quad. I would go and like, go in all of these like crazy trails. Um, skidooing in the winters were really fun. We would like attach, I don't know if this is legal, but we would attach like sleds to the back of the skidoo. At the time, so much fun, so much fun. We were ski jumping all over the place and like going on all these like bumps and stuff. It was so much fun. Cool, I love it. And growing up, would you say that you had a strong awareness of your clean show culture? Yes and no. So when my grandma passed away, when I was, I want to say like eight, she passed away in 2009. And I would say that she was one of the very few people in my life who was very culture orientated. Like she would always, I would always see her sewing. I would always see her like fixing up the meat and like just doing traditional things in her household. And at my, in my household, for example, I never, like my mom doesn't sew, like she was a working single mom. Like she didn't, obviously didn't have very much time to do those things and engage in cultural activities. But like, um, so like in my personal house, I like never really like experienced that traditional cultured lifestyle. I've been, a, I've grew up with the language though. Like my mom is fluent in clean show and, my grandma was also fluent in Klincho. Like I grew up hearing them speak it, speak it a lot. And like all my uncles, my aunties, they're all very fluent in Klincho. And like, it was very well-spoken, but I unfortunately didn't get to pick it up the same way that my older brother did. So like my older brother can speak Klincho and he can understand it. But unfortunately, like I didn't have that privilege and I'm like so mad at him. I'm like, teach me. And he refuses to teach me, but like, I'm going to, I'm going to get it out of him. <laughs> like, I'm going to sit you down and I'm, you're going to, you're going to teach me some things. Oh yeah. I'm sure the opportunity will present itself when the timing is right. Um, Jamie, you've been growing your business in Yellowknife and the surrounding communities for the last couple of years. And I remember you actually came to my backyard a few summers ago to photograph our entrepreneur team. But what's clear is that boudoir is really your thing. Oh my God, I can go on and on about the boudoir aspect of my business. And I feel like I feel like my end goal is definitely being able to do boudoir full time. And I think that's where I see myself in the next like couple of years is just shooting mainly boudoir. And it's not to say that everything else doesn't make me happy, but it's, it's definitely something that brings me a lot of joy. And I feel like I see a lot of boudoir has just taught me so much along the way. And I think when it first started, I didn't know that it was going to be this big thing in my life until I had, again, like when you first start something new, it's like, you never know what it's going to be like for you when you first start it. Yeah, that's really true. And when you land on something that makes your heart sing, you just know that it's worth pursuing it, especially when you're thinking about it as a business opportunity and there aren't many other people around doing it. I mean, Jamie, you've really brought boudoir to the city of Yellowknife. And through that, you've built up this amazing community of Northerners who are connected to each other through self-love and uh, body positivity and, and sensuality and play. And, and that's really powerful. So tell me, how did you first pick up photography in your early teens? When I first started, it was on... 
I believe it was like an iPod or something. It was one of those iPods with the steel backing and it had a single camera. And I remember I was like, oh, I really like to take photos. And I would go out with my friend to take photos with like the fall leaves in the winter time. And um, a lot of the things that I used to make the photos stand out was just the editing apps that I had on my iPod at the time. So I would edit the photos in these apps. And I was like, wow, like there's a lot more that you can do with the photo than just taking a photo. And I think the very first time I held a professional DSLR camera was when my friend at the time had asked me to go take some photos of her for this kick butt campaign. And I remember taking those photos and being able, being behind the camera for the first time made me really like realize that this is what I want to do. And this is what I want to pursue. And I remember seeing the photo, the photo that actually won the campaign was one of the photos that I took. And when I saw that for the first time, I was like, wow, this is crazy to see that this was a, this is this was the very first time I ever took a photo on a professional DSLR and it, ended up being on a campaign. You're reminding me of how much I appreciate those like contests and participation challenges for youth because they can totally inspire you to try something new and realize, wow, I'm good at this and I really like it. I'm going to pursue it. So that whole experience puts you on a path and then you started working. I got my very first job at a friendship center. I think I was like 15 and my very first paycheck, I think was like $800 or something. And I, at the time, of course, it was like a lot of money to me and it's still a lot of money. But at the time I was like, this is so much money and I'm going to use all of this money to buy my very first camera. So I went to Roy's audio And that is where I bought my very, very first camera. And I think I used my whole paycheck for it. I bought the the camera body and then whatever lens it came with. And then like a tripod, which I still have today. I still use that tripod all the time. And I think a couple of SD cards and an extra battery. And then that was it. Yeah, that's a big investment for a 15-year-old. Plus, then there's the time investment of actually learning how a camera works and all the different parts and the different lenses. And that takes a while. So at what point did you decide to transition from this being a hobby to opening up shop and, and sort of calling yourself a professional photographer? You know, I don't know anymore. (laughs) I think I was 18 when I opened, when I first like applied for my business license and I was like, okay, this is going to be a thing. And then I made a Facebook page and then I applied for like my business license. And then I applied for all of this stuff. And I was like, okay, like I'm going to make this a thing. And I had no idea what I was doing at all. Like I like kind of just went into it, like just dove right into this whole thing. And I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm doing it and it's happening right now. If it's not now, it's never. Like, when are you ever going to take this more seriously? Yeah, for real. Why wait? I don't know where I was in my head, but I remember thinking, oh my God, people are going to realize that I'm picking up photography again. I'm going to get all of these jobs. And I remember my first year was like, there was nothing. I had no, like, I think I made... $8,000 that year or something like that. I remember quitting my job thinking I was going to do this thing full time. And I think it took like a really big wake up call to make me realize this is going to take time. It's going to take a lot of time before it ever gets anywhere, but it's going to take a lot of time before I make any type of profit off of this. Like I really have to do it for myself in hopes that it would be rewarded as well, like throughout the journey. And I remember feeling like I remember it was so dumb I don't know why I like had quit my job but I did and I remember my boyfriend at the time he again like he was so supportive he like did not even like bat an eye when I told him I was quitting my job he was like okay and like at the time I had like really no big responsibilities like I didn't I wasn't paying rent I wasn't I didn't have a vehicle so I wasn't making those payments I didn't make a living at all my very first year but I that that whole experience taught me so much about how much work actually needs to go into this type of business and like how much you need to build your portfolio and build a clientele and just have patience, I think as well, like going into this thing because, or any business really, I think it's all about patience and 
again, like being smart about what it is that you're marketing and who you're marketing to and really like just all of the stuff. And it taught me a lot my very first year in photography professionally. And it taught me a lot about what it means to be a photographer, what it means to be an artist, what it means to be a person offering a service. It was a great first year, but it was also a really hard first year too. When Jamie discovered boudoir photography, she instantly fell in love with it. Since then, she's introduced it and offered it to many clients in Yellowknife, and it's become this really sought-after service. You wouldn't necessarily think that boudoir would take off in the far north, but it has. So we did some research and got the scoop on boudoir's history, because it's been around and evolving for a long time. Here's what we got. So, boudoir comes from the French and refers to a small, elegantly decorated room belonging to a woman that emerged in the early 1700s. Boudoir photography is part of a long lineage of erotic photography. As soon as there were cameras, there were erotic photographs. Contemporary boudoir photography has its roots in the 1910s and 20s, when photographers in France and the United States produced pictures of women in various states of undress, often posing against ornate backgrounds. And this was at a time when nude photographs were illegal. Pinup girl photographs were a big part of the war efforts in World War II, and women would also commission photos and drawings of themselves and send them to their husbands and boyfriends away at war. Then there was the influence of magazines like Playboy and later Penthouse, which brought erotic photography to the mainstream. While women have always used boudoir photography for their own purposes, increasingly the genre has become a means of self-empowerment, a means of reclaiming and positively expressing sexuality through intimate images. And this is something that Jamie talks about a lot. There's also a growing demand for boudoir for men and non-binary folks. If somebody were to come up to me and they would say, oh, what is dwarf photography? Like, what is it to you? I, I think I would tell them it's an empowering photography session for everyone. And I feel like it is a really like part of, I would say like a self-love journey as well. Like it's definitely either discovering or rediscovering who you are as a person in a photography session. And I think it's really powerful. It's a more intimate session for sure. Like you're really getting intimate with yourself in front of essentially like a stranger. And then at the end of the session, you're just so comfortable with your body, but you're also really comfortable with the person that you're working with. I feel like Bedore is definitely more than just Bedore. Like it's just, you can have so much into a session. You can like, you know, use it to overcome things, use it to like, you know, just push yourself past your limits. And I, like, um, the more that I've worked with people, I've gotten people who are first time photo shoot clients ever, like their first photo shoot ever was a Bador shoot. I've gotten people who have done Bador shoots in the past and like came to me and said, you've made me feel like the most comfortable I've ever felt. And I want to say, like, I feel like I, have this sense of making people kind of step out of their comfort zone a little bit, but also being comfortable doing it because I'm showing them how to do everything. You did, does that make sense? Totally makes sense. And you had been introduced to boudoir by another photographer and you had actually had that experience of being photographed yourself 
and you said that it was super positive and, and validating. And from there, as you were developing your own boudoir photography business, you connected with the amazing Karen Priscilla, who is an Indigenous makeup artist here in Yellowknife. And you two sort of teamed up as this incredible duo and started doing these boudoir shoots. How did you feel in the beginning when all of this was just getting started? I remember feeling like, oh my God, I love doing this. And I love, like when I started doing it and offering it as a service, I was like, I love this. And I remember before I started offering it, I had just kind of dove into this whole YouTube thing. Like I just kind of like dove into YouTube and was like, okay, I need to figure out how to offer it professionally. And then I came across this like YouTuber who was running a successful business as a Bador photographer and he was doing it full time. And then he also made YouTube videos on YouTube, kind of talking about how to start up a business and like giving tips and tricks. And I was like, this is what I want to do. And so I just kind of dove myself into that, um, into YouTube and like really taught myself how to navigate what it means to, again, to be a Bador photographer and how to offer the service professionally. Oh my God. YouTube is like this treasure trove of information for entrepreneurs. Like seriously, whatever you need to learn how to do, you can figure it out on YouTube. So as long as you've got decent internet, you're good to go. I remember following some other Bador, like very successful Bador photographers from the States. And I followed their social medias and then I found them on Facebook and then I joined their Facebook groups. And they really taught me a lot on how to navigate it in a business sense. And I remember when I first started offering Bador services, I remember I had put out like a like a client call or like a babe call or something like that, just to get some people in the door and like, and just to gain like that clientele, but also to build my portfolio because I didn't have a very big portfolio to offer Bador services and all of that stuff. Right. And you're offering a service that's quite unique and luxurious and not everybody is totally clear on what a boudoir session entails. Like if you're going to do it, and, and pay the money and sign up for it. It's a big commitment. So what were the first few shoots like that you did with Karen? I remember I had rented out an Airbnb and I remember booking my shoots on days on days. And I remember like having to work very quickly because it was like in the dead middle of December. So like we didn't have very much sunlight to begin with. And I remember I was like, Karen, we're going to double book today. And like, we just got to get our, like, get on a roll here. And she was like, okay. So I remember spending, I, I remember spending a ton of money on Airbnbs that month, but I remember also just like being able to rent those out and then give that experience to my clients. And then they get their hair, they get their makeup done. And it's really like, even that is a whole experience within itself because it's such a pampering time to relax and they are offered like water and chocolate and stuff. And like, just to kind of get more comfortable in the space. And uh, most clients will bring a robe with them. And I would ask them to like change into the robe if they're comfortable with it, or just like not wear a bra, because I find that sometimes bras like dig into your shoulders and like they leave these marks and stuff. Yes. All those little details matter because in the final photographs, you're exposed, like you are out there in the most beautiful way and you want to be fully prepared for it. And now I have this whole guide that I send to clients beforehand. Like I'll have to send it over to you too. And like, you can be able to see like what it, what the guide really is, but it's filled with all of this information that I just kind of picked up over the last couple of years, last year and a half, but also a guide that I also picked up from other photographers that I follow on social media who just kind of were like, okay, these are like, the tips and tricks and like all of these things that you need to offer to your clients. And like this whole guide is just, again, so valuable with so much information, so jam packed. Okay. Gotcha. And what is the shoot like from start to finish? What actually happens? Yeah. So they come in, the day would start, like they come into the studio, they get their hair and makeup done. And then after they get their hair and makeup done, um, they'll either take a little break to go to the bathroom or get something to drink or something just because they've been sitting in a chair for an hour or two. And then we go into the studio space and then we look at outfits. So 
while they're getting their hair and makeup done, I'm either finishing up like last minute touches in the studio. I'm like spraying Lysol like crazy. Um, <laughs> and I am like just getting everything ready in the studio and going through their outfits. And like, normally I have clients who bring their outfits. I feel like it's more personalized that way if they bring in their own outfits. But I also have things myself that I've been collecting over the last little bit of time that I can offer to them. And then I like get, have them get changed into their first outfit. And then we just kind of start from there and everything happens in the studio and it's just a really good, fun time. And And I guide them through the whole entire thing. Jamie, seriously, I can just picture you being a natural at keeping things really fun and creative and and safe. And you also know how to direct people. First, I'm like laying on the bed and then I, I show them what to do. And then I'm like jumping around on like the couch and like just kind of sitting in these weird positions on the floor. Like it's just, it's just a fun time. And like, I think really like, the funnest part about it is when they are doing their pose and they're all sensual and just like feeling themselves and they look over and I'm like sitting in the corner with like, it's just so funny. And like, I think that really makes, I think it's just what really makes the session. is just when you're laughing and like, when you're just like having a really good time with the people that you're working with. And I think um, from start to finish, it's just, it's always like a really good time. I love it. Maybe at some point down the line, I will treat myself to a boudoir shoot with you for a milestone birthday. I think that would be really special. Um, And I guess clients book with you for a wide variety of reasons, right? Like it is definitely an investment in self and it's a pretty profound experience. One of the things I ask is why are you interested in doing a boudoir shoot? And sometimes I get a really good inclination on what someone wants to do a shoot for. So like, it's a whole realm of things. Like it's not just one reason or the other. I get tons of clients who want to do it for themselves, which is, which is what I love because it's like really an eye opening experience. And it really teaches you a lot about who you are. And like, again, like just teaches you a lot about how far you're willing to like push yourself. And like, it's just like all about courage and bravery, but I also have clients who do it for themselves, but also for their significant other. I have clients who do it to rediscover themselves after like trauma that happens to them. And I have clients who do it because they're celebrating something. I recently had a client who was celebrating I think a year of self-love and like self-reflection. And I think they had just gotten out of like, a relation, a really long-term relationship. I was like, that's the perfect reason. That is the perfect reason. Yeah. A lot of clients come in to see themselves in somebody else's perspective. And I think that's to do with a lot of things. Like it's either because again, they, they, they don't see themselves as these beautiful human beings, which I truly think they're so wrong because I think that they're so gorgeous and like everyone that I photograph and I think everyone that I come across, there's always something beautiful about them. And I think it just takes somebody to discover that for them. And then when they see their photos for the first time, they're like, wow, I never really thought, you know, my butt could look that good. I never really thought my back could look that good or my stomach or my arms or my eyes or whatever. And like, I think it's just like somebody like a new perspective. And I think seeing yourself from somebody else's perspective can really change how you feel about yourself. We are brilliant as the snow, 10 million years of Adam's glow, shining through the deepest
Jenny Vandermeer is a dear friend, and she's a really strong Dene woman who owns a consulting practice here in the Northwest Territories, and she's a boudoir client of Jamie's. I remember when Jenny flew into Yellowknife from the Satu in the dead of winter for her boudoir shoot, and it was a really big deal. And the whole experience wound up sort of being a catalyst for a new elevated chapter in Jenny's life. So here she is sharing about it. Okay. Um, Jenny Vandermeer, Siddhi. So I'd been considering doing a photo shoot like this for some time. Um, so I turned 42 this year and I figured this was a great way to get outside of my comfort zone and, you know, learn to not only accept my changing body, but celebrate it as well. Um, within Indigenous culture, we're often taught to be quite modest. So, you know, showing my body and celebrating my body was not something that I grew up doing. It's not something that I was accustomed to, but I really wanted to push myself outside of my comfort zone and, and book this. And, and, you know, use this as part of my healing journey in a way to reconnect with, with myself, really. And had you ever done anything like this before? Meaning, like, getting in front of the camera and, and sort of um, showing yourself in your body in a more intimate way? Never. <laughs> never, never, never. Um, you know, some, my, my sexuality... Uh, is something that I've never really been comfortable with. It's not something that I, you know, grew up discussing with my family. Um, it's not something that I, you know, flaunted. Um, again, like being raised as a, a Dene person, especially as a girl, you're, you're taught that your sexuality can be really something that's dangerous, you know, something that could make you a target. So, and your beauty could be the same. So I, I learned to really try to make myself smaller so that I wouldn't be targeted in a negative way. So showing my body in this way was not something that I'd ever done. And it was definitely outside of my comfort zone. Hmm. That's something that Jamie talks about a lot, that it really is an invitation to, to step outside of that comfort, but that she also makes sure that she works with you as the client to make sure that you're still feeling safe. When you first decided to reach out to Jamie and get the conversation going, what was that like? Jamie was incredible, you know, from her online booking system to the calls that we had, she was there to answer all questions that I had that I had, as well as alleviate any kind of fears and insecurities that I had. I had explained to her that, as I mentioned, this is part of, this was part of my healing journey. I've been in recovery since 2016, and I was struggling with feeling sexy and, you know, feeling connected to that part of myself since I got sober. And it was impacting my relationship um, with my my spouse. And so I thought that if I were to do this, it would help me really get in touch with this huge part of my life. Like your sexuality is so, you know, linked to who you are. It is such a big part of who you are that, you know, being disconnected from it just wasn't working for me. It wasn't, I didn't feel like a whole person. And so when I was having these discussions with her, she made me feel so safe she, you know, she welcomed all questions. There was no judgment from her whatsoever. It was just an, an overall incredible experience. And I remember, I think, being with you in Yellowknife a couple of days leading up to the shoot. Um, and if you've never done something like this before, I would imagine that there's almost some stage fright. Um, you're definitely 
stepping into a new arena. Can you describe how you were feeling in those days leading up to the big shoot? Oh, I was so, I was terrified. (laughs) I was so nervous. I had no idea what to expect. I kept on thinking, oh my God, what if my mom finds out what I'm doing? (laughs) Even though, you know, I'm a grown woman. um, Still, there was that, you know, that, that fear of judgment of like, what is she doing? You know, dressing this way and, you know, taking her clothes off essentially to get in front of a camera, like, what is she thinking? Wow. And I, and I'm distinctly remembering that you were looking at different harnesses and outfits, but the one thing that you knew for sure was that you were going to incorporate your fur coat. Yes. Oh my God. I was so excited to get the opportunity to wear my full length fur coat, um, You know, it's fur is something that we use in Indigenous culture, um, in our clothing quite often. And so for me to be able to use it in this way, I felt was honoring, you know, my Indigenous identity, but also it's just super sexy and, you know, so glamorous. And, you know, it's, it's that part of myself that I don't really get to play with very often is, you know, playing dress up. And it reminded me of being a little girl again. And just having fun with clothes and like stepping into these different personas. And yeah, it was so liberating. And so walk me through the actual day, because the way that Jamie has described it, it is like full on from 10 in the morning until three or four in the afternoon, but it goes by in a flash. Can you sort of describe what happened that day and everything that you were experiencing? Yeah, for sure. So Jamie was so great, though. She gave me tons of advice on what to do the weeks leading up to the shoot, but also the night before. So, you know, make sure you get a good night's sleep, um, drink tons of water. Um, You know, I don't drink alcohol or, you know, do anything like that. But she was explicit. Don't drink any alcohol because, you know, it makes you look more dehydrated and you want to look your best for the shoot, right? So she had tons of really good advice leading up to it. And so I showed up in the morning, making sure I'd had, you know, a good breakfast and was well hydrated and well rested. And I met um, my, you know, amazing makeup artist, who's also Indigenous, and just spent the next hour and a half getting glammed up. And it was incredible because, you know, I'd never, I'm not one to wear a lot of makeup typically so it was nice to just to have that done and have it done by an indigenous artist as well like so talented and I was just blown away by how beautiful and you know natural she made me look like she really brought out my best features and she did my hair and Jamie helped me with the outfits that I brought and it was so fun she um When we were ready to get started, you know, she could tell I was nervous. So she's like, I'm going to put some music on and we're just going to start with some basic poses. And she walked me through step by step how to get into the poses. She's like, move your hand here, arch your back a little bit more. Look at me, you know, like everything. So I just had to follow her and turn my brain off and, you know, quiet those fears. And she led me through step by step and at the end of the day, I, it, like you said, it flew by. At, but at the end of the day, I couldn't believe the amount of pictures that we got that were so beautiful, but also that change that had occurred in me just within those last few hours. At the end of the session, I was walking around naked in her studio, totally comfortable. And I never, never would have thought that I would do something like that because I had explicitly told her, I'm not getting naked. So just so you know, in the beginning of the session, and then two hours later, I was just buck, (laughs) buck naked. (laughs) It was great. Oh my gosh. I love that you came in there with some like hard and fast rules. And then by the end, it's just like all of that goes out the window. And it, and it really is also about that relationship and that connection that you, that you developed with Jamie. So I, I would imagine you left that day feeling 
pretty transformed. What was it like when you actually saw the photos? I couldn't believe the woman in, in those photos was me. It felt like I was looking at a different person. But at the same time, it felt like I was looking at an old friend, if that makes sense. Like someone who I had lost somewhere along the way was there in those photos. And, you know, what the, the woman I saw in those photos was beautiful and powerful and fearless and just fierce. And I, I couldn't believe that was me. And I'm like, wow, is that who I really am, you know, and Jamie was able to help pull that out of me. It had nothing really to do with like the physicality, like, you know, of course the, the, the pictures were beautiful, but you could see that inner strength that came out of those photos. And that's what really captured me. And I was blown away. Often I find that within indigenous communities, but also the way mainstream society views Indigenous people, particularly Indigenous women, is that we are only meant to fit these specific molds. And breaking out of those molds, you know, can be really scary and it can be really frightening. But again, I think our whole purpose of being here, why Creator put us here, is to, to figure that out and to really celebrate it. And, you know, sexuality is a huge part of who you are. So we can't stifle that, you know, um, you can't hide it, you can't deny it. Um, I think it's just a matter of being proud of everything that you are, all parts of it. Jamie, something that's really notable about your business is the incredibly active boudoir Facebook group that you've created. And it's a space for your clients and for potential clients and everybody in between to connect with each other and engage in conversations that are often very funny and cheeky and always super inclusive. And I know it takes a lot of work to keep something like that going, but it's also a wonderful way and tool to expand what you offer as a boudoir photographer. And it's just this other layer of the whole experience. And I can see that it means a lot to you and everyone who's a part of it. And, and I'm in the Facebook group and I mean, people are updating daily and it's a lot of fun. I want this to work out because I want people to feel good about themselves when they come here. I want people to feel like this is a safe space when they're in this group. And like, although it's just a Facebook group, it's a Facebook group that kind of holds a lot. I have clients or I have people in the group that say that they love the group, that they love being in there, that it's such a positive and uplifting community. And I'm so happy because it's like, I, I started it, but it's really the people in there that created it, if that makes sense, that made it such a beautiful place to be in like a positive community to be a part of. Yeah. And it's definitely one of the main spots of where I book my clients now. Like at the beginning, it was all through Facebook. It was all through like social, like Instagram, but I wanted to have a community or a place where I can have potential future clients in there. And just to be able to interact with them and have them get to know me a little bit and be like, oh, like what the heck, who is this Jamie Stevenson person? And then they discover that Jamie is this amazing 22-year-old clean show woman. I mean, I still find that kind of unbelievable. What do you think it was that pushed you to get your business going at such a young age? Childhood trauma. <laughs> I would say like, I like, I... I don't know. I feel like I had like growing up, like go backtracking a little bit. I, I had to grow up a little earlier than most of my friends because, because of things that I've experienced in life early on. And like at the time to me, of course, like the way that you're, your upbringing to you is so normal. But the second I talk about these things with people, they're like, that's not normal. You know, like that's, I definitely like 
had some childhood trauma growing up and like, it kind of, it forced me to grow up as well. So like when I was younger, I like experienced like sexual assault. I've experienced like physical abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, like just everything. And it was like really hard on me for a really long time. And like, and I didn't know how to properly regulate my emotions. I didn't know how to properly like communicate my emotions. I was at a point where I bottled everything up and it was just, it was a lot at the time. And like, I think a lot of it, I think a lot of things that really helped me was definitely like social media. I would say a big part of it is social media because like looking and seeing other people who have overcome similar things to what I overcome and see, you know, that they were being successful doing, you know, the thing on their own and like just all of that stuff that kind of put some kind of light at the end of the tunnel for me, if that makes sense. Like it wasn't completely dark anymore. And I was like, I was like, okay, if they can do it, I can do it. I feel like social media, although we know it can be painful and destructive, has opened a lot of doors for us to connect with new communities in really intentional ways and find people who have similar stories. And, you know, through those connections, we feel really seen and heard and validated and we also see how other people are working through their pain and how they're healing. And I just think that's really inspiring. And it helps, of course, if we can find people who look like us um, and who come from similar backgrounds, right? Because representation really matters. Um, I've also had people come up to me and tell me that I like have a really good representation of indigenous humans on my platform. And I didn't really realize that until like, I really took a good look at it the other day. And I was like, wait, this is so true. Like, I don't, like, I didn't realize it until like, I had to take a look at it. And I was like, this is amazing. And I think, again, just using a service like this to overcome a lot of things in your personal life. So for example, like trauma or like rediscovering and redefining who you are. I think it's so empowering again, just to have, and to be able to offer this type of service to people who like want to, um, kind of step out of their comfort zone, but also kind of take control and take back what's theirs. If that makes sense. Oh. Jamie is a light, and I really love her willingness to talk about her life so openly, and that's super important because a lot of young people look up to her, that I know. And I think that Indigenous business owners often shoulder a lot of responsibility because they're such positive forces in their community. But being an entrepreneur is hard work, and it's a lot to be building a business while also healing from intergenerational trauma and taking care of family and, and friends and community. So I just have a ton of respect for where Jamie is at and how much she's able to incorporate her authentic self into her business. Of course, Jamie is super active on social media, so go follow her and check out her gorgeous website, jamiestevensonphotography.com and it's got a whole section dedicated to boudoir. So if you're in Yellowknife or you've been looking for an extra special reason to go, maybe now is the time to book a shoot with Jamie. I promise it'll be a highly indulgent, self-affirming experience. Plus, you'll be supporting a young Indigenous woman and her business. So go for it. Venture Out's production team includes myself, our amazing co-producer, Travis Mercredi, and our equally amazing lead researcher, Jess Duncan. Our theme song is called Fires Across the Tundra, and it's by the one and only Den and Day's Leela Gilday. Today, you also heard Leela's track from 2020 called Giants. 
Venture Out's next episode marks our season one finale. It has been such a wonderful ride and we're really grateful for all the support and the listeners and the entrepreneurs who had just have the best stories to share. So please be sure to tune into our finale episode. I'll keep the guest a secret for now and get ready for season two, which premieres in early 2022. You can find Venture Out on all your favorite podcast platforms. And if you like what you're hearing, subscribe and give us a rating. We'd love to hear from you, so please reach out on Entrepreneurs Instagram and Facebook, or you can send us an email at podcast at entrepreneurth.ca. See you next time. We are